be formed, but it won't prosper. When the darkness falls, it won't prevail. Cause the God I serve knows only how to triumph. My God will never My God, He'll never fail. I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. There's power in the mighty name of Jesus. Every war he wages, he will win. I'm not backing down from any giant. I know how the story ends I know how the story ends And I'm gonna see a victory I'm gonna see a victory For the battle belongs to you, Lord I'm gonna see a victory I'm gonna see a victory For the battle belongs to you, Lord There's power in the mighty name of Jesus Every war he wages, he will win I'm not backing down many giants I know how my story ends I know how my story ends I'm gonna see a victory I'm gonna see a victory for the battle belongs to A victory I'm gonna see a victory yes for the battle belong to you Lord you take what the enemy meant for evil and you turn it for good you turn it for I'm gonna see a victory I'm gonna see a victory For the battle belongs to you, Lord I'm gonna see a victory I'm gonna see a victory For the battle belongs to you
I'm going to see a victory for the battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see a victory for the battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm going to see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory for the battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory for the battle belongs to you, Lord. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how You took what the enemy meant for evil And you turned it for good Turned it for good Do you believe that this morning? You took what the enemy meant for evil Lord, you turned it for good You turned I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory. Yes, for the battle belongs to you, Lord.
Amen. Amen. This is how we fight our battles. Amen. Jesus, help us. I can tell you what a mighty God we serve. And I can tell you that he is more than able to do above and beyond. Again, what we ask or think of him this morning. Well, I want to talk to you for the next few minutes. <clears throat> ask the Lord to help me today. If you'll turn in your Bibles to the book of 2 Kings, chapter 6. I want to read this morning and trust the Lord to help me today to speak that which he would have me speak, only that which he would. Amen. To speak for him today, to, that he would speak through us and that we would be changed and challenged in this hour that we live. What a day it is to be alive for God, to be on his side this morning. Praise the Lord. We'll turn again there, Second Kings chapter 6, verse 1 and 7. If you found that, and already if you're able to stand, I'm going to read the word, and then we're going to get into the message this morning. Second Kings chapter 6, verse 1. And the sons of the prophets said unto Elisha, Behold, now the place where we dwell with thee is too straight for us. Let us go, we pray thee, unto Jordan, and take thence every man a beam, and let us make us a place there where we may dwell. <clears throat> and he answered, Go ye. And one said, Be content, I pray thee, and go with thy servants. And he answered, I will go. So he went with them, and when they came to Jordan, they cut down wood. But as one was felling a beam, the axe head fell into the water, and he cried and said, Alas, master, for it was borrowed. And the man of God said, Where fell it? And he showed him the place, and he cut down a stick and cast it in thither, and the iron did swim. Therefore he said, He take it up to thee, and he put out his hand and took it. Let us pray. Father God, this morning, thank you for everything that's been done already. We thank you for your presence we feel here today. We're asking you to anoint our minds and our hearts to receive. Lord, I pray that this would go forth today in power. I ask you to touch hearts and change lives. I pray those listening by way of live stream would be touched today. Wherever this message goes, Lord, hearts would be uh, united and touched through the power of the Holy Spirit. We're asking for you, Lord, to give us strength today. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, Amen. For the next few minutes, I want to talk on this subject. I've entitled... How many knows a loss we cannot afford? A loss we cannot afford. And so I want to take you to the place this morning where the school of prophets had become too small. We find here that they resolved with Elisha consent to build a bigger place. One of the young men, while cutting a tree, had lost his axe head and it fell in the water. The young man began to cry out to Elisha for help. Because the axe head had been borrowed. It wasn't his to lose. It was borrowed. And I can tell you the man showed him the place where it sank. And Elisha cut a stick down and cut it, put it in the water and the iron did swim. It floated. Now the place where these prophets met was too small. God was fixing to enlarge their territory. How many believe our tent's too small this morning? Amen. I believe God is trying to enlarge the tents today. I believe he wants to see uh, lives changed forever and touched by the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. You and I alone can, we can take this message to the streets. We can take it uh, uh, to the, everywhere in this world this morning, to all the parts of this world, and we can see results because God, listen folks, the sun shines. Uh, and, and how many knows on the good and the evil? How many knows he, he reigns on the just and the unjust? But I can tell you one thing for sure. There is a church right now that is ready and able to do what God has called her to do. And how many believes we must be a part of that? We cannot do it in ourselves we cannot do it without help how many knows we're not going to do it in the flesh it's not going to happen it must be done through the power of the holy spirit god wants to enlarge our territory he wants us to occupy the place that he's enlarged for us how many knows we have to take the place that we have occupied now listen that occupy you've heard me say uh, multiple times that that is a military term Occupy. That means to take over. That means to set up a, to take over the place. How many believe as the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, how many believe the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof? How many believe you and I have an obligation to take back everything the 
devil has destroyed and tried to take from us and destroy our families, our homes, our marriages in this country. I can tell you it's at stake. Everything's at stake. Everything's on the line. But if there's a church that will rise up in this hour, we can put an end. We can do something if we'll touch God this hour. We can make a difference. Listen, God wants to enlarge us, but we have to occupy the place we have. We have to fill it up. We have to take care of it. We have to make sure that, 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 that everything is secured and that God is moving among us this morning. In Exodus chapter 23 and verse 30, By little and little I will drive them out from before thee until thou be increased and inherit the land. When the children of Israel went into Canaan, they didn't take it all at one time. But little by little, inch by inch, just a piece at a time. That's how they, I, I tell my wife, when I get into projects over over my head. I, sometimes I bite off more than I can chew. She said, how are you going to do this? I said, one bite at a time. We have to take charge. We have to go forward. We have to. I tell you, how do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. You just take a step forward and you go in that anointing and the power of God. You take it. You go by force. The Bible said that the, 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 the righteous, I can tell you something folks, that we are to be, that we're to be the people of God. We're to go forth in power and demonstration. We're not to sit back and watch the world uh, just dissolve and dis be in self-destruction mode, but we got to make a difference. we got to save every person that we can before it's too late. But something has happened. One of the young men has lost his axe head while chopping down a tree. This prophet, while he's there to build a bigger place, while he's there chopping down trees, something happens. The axe head flies off the handle and goes into the River Jordan. It just disappears. It sinks. It's gone. There's no way. It looks like it's hopeless situation. Something terrible has happened here and the man cries out. Oh my. He said it was borrowed. What am I going to do? And he cries out to the prophet, Elisha. Listen to me, church. Something's happened. God has given the church territory to occupy. He's driven back the enemy. But in the process of time, the church has lost the axe head. Somewhere along the line, something has happened in this hour. How many of you would agree with me that the church I read about in the Bible... The church that was going forth in demonstration, that was reaching their world, that was reaching their communities. How I many knows when you take a snapshot of that and you hold our picture up to it today, there's quite a difference. Would anybody agree with us today? All I'm saying is, is that there's something missing in this hour and we've got to reclaim it, we've got to repossess it, and we've got to take it charge and occupy till Jesus comes. Amen. Give the Lord a hand. The anointing of God is what breaks the yoke and destroys the yoke. The axe head, this anointing. Listen, folks, it is the anointing that gives us the cutting edge that helps advance the kingdom. We can drive or we can push the car. Nothing worse. Anybody ever push the car? <laughs> Three of you. Four, there you go, four, five, six. I pushed a car before. I didn't like it. <laughs> I, I ran out of gas. Cars broke down. Had to push it out of the road. How many knows you can keep gas in it and keep driving or you can push the thing around? I want to drive. I want to keep it full of fuel. I want to keep it ready to go at any time because I need I don't want to have to push it. I tell you, I couldn't push it very far if I did. If I did, I couldn't even move it very far at all. And it's not going to happen. It's the same way with the church. We can push or we can drive by the power of the Holy Spirit can drive us this morning. We can move in the flesh or we can operate in the Spirit and we can take this world by the storm. Hallelujah. We can reach people for Christ. Understand, it is the anointing that gives us the cutting edge that helps us advance the kingdom. Whenever the anointing is lost, the church may still attempt to chop wood and try to clear land even though the axe head is lost. She may continue to go through the motions, but no wood is falling as a result of her efforts. We can continue as usual. We can do business as usual if we want to. We can just keep going and just kind of uh, coasting along, but I can tell you there's no wood going to fall 
They're going to be not. They're not going to be very little salvations taking place. There's going to be very little uh, uh, territory gain. Very little advancement's going to happen. But if we will, by the power and the anointing of God, allow Him one more time to touch us, how many knows we can move in the power of Almighty God, and we can make a difference again. We can make a difference again. Listen, something is missing in this hour. We don't have to, we don't need to just go through the motions. The young man knew it was hopeless to try and continue without the axe head. He cried out to the prophet, the man of God. I think it's time you and I recognize this morning that something's lost. And until we recognize that, we'll never recover. We won't go after something unless we realize it's not there. I can tell you it's important to know that something has changed in the this hour. You can see it. You can feel it. There's a different temperature. There's a different atmosphere than what some of you may have grew up in. What we saw. I can tell you but it don't have to be this way because he'll do it again as they sung this morning. One more time. How many blues? He will do it again. Walls will fall. Giants will tumble. I can tell you hell will be intimidated and we'll know there's a church in charge here today has to be that again something's lost in this hour hear me church I can tell you this we, 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 we must try we must cry out to God and tell him we've lost the axe head we've lost the cutting edge the worst part about it is folks it was borrowed it wasn't even his to lose how many of this anointing we have this Holy Spirit that's been given to us is not ours to toy with, to play with, to lose. How many believe this church that God is raising up in this hour? I can tell you folks, it's not going to happen until you and I make up our mind. We, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. We will overcome. We will charge forward. We will advance. We will not retreat. We'll not back down. We're not going to lay down and play dead for the devil. We're going to stand up. We're going to shout. We're going to to go forward and we're going to press this thing. We're going to move in this hour. We cannot afford to stay down. Hear me church the worst part he realized it was borrowed. This anointing is not ours to lose. This anointing that I have the world didn't give it to me and the world can't take it away. But I can be careless and reckless with this anointing like Samson and lose it. Revival swept through this country years ago and the church exploded. But we didn't maintain revival, so we lost it. We didn't keep it up. We didn't maintain it. We took it for granted. As if it's always going to be this way. As if everything's going to stay the same. Nothing's ever going to change. I'm going to tell you something, folks. you got to change the oil in that car if you want to keep it running. you got to add some fuel in there if you want to keep the thing running. There's some maintenance involved. There's something that has to be done on our part. We have to be available. We have to say, Lord, here I am. Use me. Whatever I can do. No matter how little. No matter how least I can do. Let me do what you want me to do. And make. I want to be available to you, God. And I want to push this thing to the end. It's the anointing that gives us the cutting edge. It helps us advance the kingdom. I can tell you something, church. The anointing that I have didn't come through this world. Didn't come through the flesh. But it came through the Spirit. I can be careless like Samson. And I can lose it this morning. Revival came to this country. I'm looking for another one. But revival came to this country. Years ago, we saw the tent revivals, the great revivals, the Welsh revival. We saw, well, that was, we saw that, but we also saw the turn of the century in California, the Sousa Street revival. We saw these things happen. We saw God move. We saw the birth of the assemblies of God. We saw several things happened in that hour. Many things began to move. People were moving. Lives were being changed. Heart, I can tell you, then we moved on to the 40s, the 50s. We saw the tent revivals across this nation. Blind eyes were open. Deaf ears were open. People were getting up and walking out of wheelchairs. Things were happening in that hour. But somewhere along the line we lost the axe head. We just took it for granted. I can tell you don't miss something till it's gone. And I can tell you I'm missing what we're missing this morning. Can somebody give God glory? I want to see it again. I want to be about it. I want to go after it again. Come Lord Jesus. Work in us this morning. We must recover 
the axe head anointing. We must recover. We must cry to God and confess we've lost something that was not ours to lose. The stick that Elisha cut down and threw in the water represented the cross. Why didn't that young prophet, why didn't he cut down a stick? Why didn't he throw it in there? Why didn't he make the axe head float? He's a man of God. He's no less a man of God than Elisha. He's a man of God too. I'm here to tell you, if you're born again, you love Jesus, and you give your heart to Him, you're a man or woman of God. But I can tell you, he's missing something that the prophet Elisha had. And he recognizes that. He can't make it swim. He's no less a, a man of God. He loves the Lord. He cried out. He understood the position. He realized to go through the motions was futile. Nothing's going to happen. Nothing's going to get done. We're just going to keep doing the same old thing, going around in circles, just sitting on a tread, uh, walking on a treadmill, sitting in a rocking chair. Nothing's going to happen till the anointing is returned. Nothing's going to happen till the axe head begins to come back, till we get it back, till we recover what was lost in this generation. Can somebody understand I'm talking about there's something missing in this? hour and the young man cried out to the prophet he said alas master it was borrowed I've lost this axe head and it was not mine to lose when Elisha put down cut down a stick in the water that represented the cross of Jesus Christ a typology of the cross that was able to take our sins away. That was able to make sure that we could have the things we need. To make sure that we prepare us for whatever it is God wants to do for us in this hour. The only way back to Zion is through the cross. Help us Lord to find our way back. To find our way back. To get back to that place. I, I, I know we, we, we love Jesus. We're all, we, uh, for all I know everybody in here. We're all Christians. We love God. But I can tell you something, that don't mean something's not missing. That don't mean there's something we could do to make a difference. I can tell you there's something. I know what you got's good, but I can tell you what you can get to make what you got even better. Yes. Wish somebody get happy. Because I sure am. Hear me, church. We must recover the anointing. Lord, restore this anointing back to your church. Take us back to where we first lost it and let us recover it. To the place we lost it. I heard a preacher say one time, it was a time in old Robert's life where things weren't operating the way they should have been. A time where it seemed like things were, uh, had just come to a standstill and he, he felt like there was something wrong, something missing. This preacher told me that he went back to the place the very place where God touched him as a young man. He touched him and placed this on his life. And he went back and he crawled in that place, laid before God on his face, and met God there in a mighty way. How many believe God can do something in this hour? There's nothing, there's no telling what could happen. If you think the church is doing something now, just see what she'll do in a little while when the anointing, when everything we lost has been recovered through the power of Christ. Recover that. I can tell you, car's still good. I'm not going to junk it because it's out of fuel. <laughs> you got a brand new car. Maybe you got a brand new truck out there. I don't know. You're going to run it out of gas? You're going to throw it away? Give it to me. I'll fix it. I'll put some fuel in it. You don't throw it away. You don't junk it. God ain't junking his church. God's just saying... If you pull up to the gas pump this morning, I'll fill you up. Hallelujah. Can somebody give God? I'll pour it in you. I'll fill you to the top. I'll overflow it. Glory to God. That's all I'm saying. Listen to me, church. This, this, the Lord, I can tell you, restore. Lord, restore this anointing back to your church. Take us to where we first lost it and let us recover. If we want to build, if we want to cause the timber to fall, again, see territory enlarged, we have to recover the anointing. We have to recover the axe head. The altar is a good place to start. Somebody say the altar is a good place to start. It is here that we repent. We are restored. It is here we regain our position and we overcome. The altar is the place to go to get back to our cutting edge to get refreshed. 
The Bible said in 2 Chronicles 7, 14, if my people who are called by my name, he's talking to the church, will humble themselves and pray. <laughs> Turn from their wicked ways. Then will I hear from heaven and heal their land. Oh my. I'm talking to the church. I'm, I'm talking to God's people. There's something in this hour that's missing. And it's not ours to lose. Listen, Lord, restore this to us. The altar is a good place to start. The altar is a place to go to get back to the cutting edge, to get refreshed. Acts 3 and verse 9 says, Repent ye therefore and be converted that the, your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. The Pentecostal church is distinctive because of the baptism in the Holy Spirit. This baptism has been the cutting edge for the church since the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. But in this hour, there's something missing. We've lost our cutting edge. It's quiet in this church this morning, but that's okay. I know you're listening. What made Samson different from other men? That's a rhetorical question. I don't need you to answer. But what made Samson different from other men? Think about it. You know, oh, he had big muscles. I don't know about that. I don't think God had to pick out Mr. Atlas to put anointing on. <laughs> I like to believe he's, you know, big, husky. He could have been a skinny <laughs> little runt for all I know. But I like to think he was built, chiseled out. But let me tell you something, folks. It wouldn't matter without the anointing. He was just that. What made Samson different from other men? I can tell you what made it different. The anointing. What made Samson different from other men? It was the Holy Spirit. The anointing. Without this empowerment from God, he was just an ordinary man. Samson was just an ordinary man. He couldn't fight the Philistines. He couldn't slay a thousand people with the jawbone of a donkey. He couldn't get out there and do anything significant for the. He couldn't have lifted the gates of God's on his shoulders and carried them several miles up the mountain. He couldn't have done any of that without God. That's what set him apart from other men. I can tell you, the baptism of the Holy Spirit is what sets the church apart. It's a distinction. It's not that this prophet was any less a man of God than Elisha. But I can tell you, he sure made, after he saw that iron swim, I think he thought to himself, I sure like to have what he's got. <laughs> Give the Lord a hand. You just missed your chance, so I'm going to help you out there. A little slow, that's okay on the takeoff. But I can tell you, that man of God, He's still a man of God. He wasn't any less. But after he saw Elisha make that hack's head swim, he said, I sure want what that man's got. <laughs> I can tell you, seeing the revivals in the past, when I read the book of Acts and I read through the Bible, I sure want what them people had. Oh, hallelujah. I want to do. I want to make a difference. I don't want to just be a whatnot till Jesus comes back. <laughs> I praise God anyway. I'm still preaching to those of you that hadn't got tuned in yet. Samson was a Nazarite, born with a Nazarite vow. He was consecrated vessel, raised up by God to be a deliverer for God's people. But like the Pentecostal church, Samson toyed with God's anointing. Samson slept with the enemy, fornicated with harlots, and desecrated God's temple. He was allowed to operate in God's anointing for a time, even though he would defile himself over and over again. But the time came. When the enemy gouged his eyes out. When he fell asleep in Delilah's lap. You know the story, right? Did you all learn that in children's church or Sunday school? How Samson laid in Delilah's lap and she played with his hair. And, you know, and said, oh, Samson, I love you, honey. She loved the money, honey, is what she loved. They offered her some money. And she sold Samson like he was a... Just a, 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 just a piece of real estate. They paid her money. The Philistines said, find out where his strength lies. Find out what makes him different from other men. 
We run up against church people all the time. We run up against all the kinds of people that say that are, that are, that are uh, men and women of God. But we've never run up on something like this before. Find out why he's different. What's going on? She said, Samson, why are you so strong? What makes you so strong? He makes up all these stories. <laughs> and so finally she's so aggravated with him. She finally says, if you really love me, you're going to tell me how you get your strength. I'm tired of this. Samson finally gives in and tells her, if you cut my hair, I'll lose what I have. And as he fell asleep, she called in the shears. They began to shave his head. When he woke up, he's a different man. He's still Israel's deliverer. Still the judge of Israel. But he's lost his anointing. Listen to me. They mocked and made fun of him. I won't preach that message. It's a to I, I, just, I don't have time. I just want to lay some groundwork. Tell you something's missing. You understand that like Samson, we toyed with the anointing. We still felt God in church. We still feel God in church. So we justify the loss. Hello? Amen? Let's just... Uh, we, we feel it, but we still feel God. So it must be okay. We had a good service last week. Everybody, you know... I saw two people really getting into it and I saw the church really clapping and shouting and everybody was fine. Preacher, <laughs> still felt the anointing, of course. But something's missing. Am I preaching to live bodies? Something happened. Samson's still the judge of Israel. He's still the deliverer. But I can tell you something's happened. He woke up a different man. When he woke up, Samson shook himself and knew not the spirit had left him. He didn't even know the spirit had left him. Now, if that's not the saddest commentary I've ever read in my entire life. He didn't even know the spirit. How many believe the church for years has had something missing and they didn't even know it? Can I say the church in this hour, there's something missing and we don't even recognize it. We don't even realize something's missing. Because, well, it's still good. I'm going to tell you something. You have to understand that when Samson woke up and he'd done what he always did, nothing happened. The day came, but the day has come like the children of Judah. They came weeping and crying, seeking God, saying, show us the way back to Zion. We must repent and ask God to show us the way back to the anointing. If we are to recover what we've lost, we must return to the Spirit. Galatians chapter 3 and verse 3 says this, Are you so foolish, talking to the Galatian church, Are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, you started out in the Spirit, and you're now made perfect by the flesh? In other words, you started good, you started in the Spirit, and you want to finish in the flesh. Are you, what's, what is going on here? What's happening here? When Ezekiel was in the valley of dry bones, he was asked, can these bones live again? Ezekiel replied, God, only you know. God told Ezekiel to prophesy to the bones. Then he heard the shaking of the bones come together. Well, oh, I feel that. Elisha began to speak and prophesy to preach to dead bones. My. Woo! We got it fairly, we've got it relatively good today. You imagine preaching to dead bones. Dead men, dead. Everybody's dead. Everybody. Bones scattered. Ankle bone over here. We used to sing a little song when I was a kid. Ankle bone, neck, you know. Never mind. But anyway. I'm just saying that bones scattered everywhere just come apart. They, and all of a sudden, Ezekiel's got to preach a message down to cemetery. <laughs> Lord hadn't sent me there yet. Now, I've been in a few churches I've mistaken for a cemetery. Never mind. But he preached to these dead bones. 
He began to preach. And the Holy Spirit began to move. Hmm. And as Ezekiel preached, he heard a shaking. He heard this clamor, bones shaking. My God, bones coming together, standing up, being reconnected. Something's happening. Not over yet. So Ezekiel, God tells Ezekiel to prophesy of the bones. Then, as he heard the shaking of the bones come together, the next thing God says is prophesy of the wind. Thus saith the Lord. Ezekiel, now the bones have come together, just a bunch of dead bones. Now they're not scattered, they're connected. They're together. They're standing, so to speak. They're together. Now what I want you to do is prophesy to the wind. Wind can be translated breath of God, spirit, in the Bible. And so he prophesied to the wind. And the Bible said, <laughs> thus saith the Lord. Ezekiel said, come from the four winds, O breath. Breath of God. And breathe upon these slain that they may live. So Ezekiel prophesies to the wind. It says, oh, come ye breath and breathe upon these dead bones that they may live. Oh, it's getting better. And all of a sudden, God caused skin to come on these bones. And all of a sudden, these men, their heart began to beat. They began to open up their eyes. And God put an army of men and women before that prophet. And he stood there and just looked at it. And he stood there in mesmerization as the Holy Spirit began to blow on dead men's bones. And dead men got up and walked. Do it again, Lord. Breathe upon us again one more time. Wake us up, God, out of our stupor. Bring us alive, God. One more time. Do it again, Lord. Oh, my. Oh, God, breathe on us. Hear me, church. God was saying to Ezekiel, talk to me and I'll talk to you. The Holy Ghost, He is the breath of God. We desperately need to breathe the breath of life back into the church. How many knows we need that again? Oh, God, breathe on us. Raise us up from the dead. We need God's breath now. I want to hear the sound in the tops of the mulberry trees. For those of you, that's just when David was going to battle against the Philistines. He asked God if it was time to fight the Philistines and to charge them. He said, hold on. He said, when you hear a noise in the top of those trees, that's me. And when you hear that noise in the top of them trees, take and go fight and you'll defeat the Philistines. And so David heard the sound in the tops of the mulberry trees. And when he heard that sound, he knew it was good to go. He knew everything was in place. How many believe one more time? We want to hear a sound from heaven. A sound in the spirit realm. Listen to me. Breathe on us, God. David heard it. Understand. In the tops of the mulberry trees. I can tell you it's happening. I want to hear the shaking of bones coming together. The sound of a rushing mighty wind. We must talk to God in this hour. Lord, restore unto us the years that the locust hath eaten. The canker worm, the caterpillar, and the palmer worm. Joel 2.25. Ezekiel 47.9 says the river must... We're, I want to say the river must flow again. But you don't have to beg the river to flow. We just have to remove the sin. It'll flow. God, flood this place with your anointing. Lord, dissolve every blood clot in my body. Remove every blockage in my body that's keeping the blood from flowing. I'm still getting blood. I'm still getting a small amount squeezing through. It's squeezing through. There's a blockage somewhere. There's, a, there's an obstacle somewhere. Some have to go to the hospital and they have to run a wire up in you and they have to unclog it and unplug it so you can get the full amount of blood flowing through your heart and through your body again. You're still living. You're still eating. You're still breathing. You're still alive. But if you'll get that done, you'll breathe better. You'll live better. And you'll know 
though something's took place. Oh God, one more time, stick that in our hearts. Go through our veins, unblock every blockage, move every hindrance, and let the river flow again. God, let the river flow. That's what I'm talking about. Oh my, I'm, I'm getting carried away here. Losing all my dignity. Hear me, church. Understand, we must talk to God in this hour. The river must flow again. God, flood this place. Every blood clot dissolved. Every blockage removed. Let the river flow. The only thing that can prevent the river from flowing is an obstacle blocking the flow, which is sin. Psalm 66, verse 18. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. It doesn't mean God's deaf. It just means God won't acknowledge until that's dealt with. Psalm 85, 6 says, Wilt thou not revive us again? <laughs> David, the psalmist, somebody's crying out, God, wilt thou not revive us again? Make us alive again? Our prayer should be, Wash us in your blood. We repent of every sin and we return to you, O God, with a broken heart and a contrite spirit. We need you to open up the windows of heaven and pour us out a blessing there's not room enough to receive in this hour. I love the Lord, and I know you love God. I have no doubt, no doubt in my mind. But I can tell you, folks, I told this years ago, I used to drive, my father would, it would drive him crazy. He'd bank fish on the bank, the lake, and then boats would come by. And they'd cause all this wake. And they'd, you know, maybe one come by with a 50 horsepower motor. Or 75 horsepower. But every now and then, one of them shiny boats and bass boats would come by with two. 150. 200 horsepower engine on the back of that boat. I'm thinking, what in the world? They're going to drive my dad crazy. I was ready to go home anyway. It didn't bother me. I was tired of fishing. Them boats come through there, son. I'm telling you, it's just like a... Listen, folks, we can get the job done in a rowboat. We can, we can do good things for the kingdom in a, in a kayak. But I choose, I like to have me one of them boats with two, two, 200 horsepower engines on it. My goodness, I'm just talking about the power of God. I'm talking about the anointing that makes the difference. What are we doing? What are we going to do? Will thou not revive us again? Wash us in your blood. Create in us. Give us clean hands and a pure heart. Everywhere the river flows, everything it touches shall be healed. Get in the river now. Run toward God and let the river overflow you now. Let us be receptive to your Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter 2, verse 1 through 4, they were all gathered together in the upper room, 120 men and women waiting for the promise of God to empower them with the Holy Ghost. They heard a sound from heaven as it filled the upper room. Cloven tongues of fire sat upon each of them, and they spake with tongues as the Spirit gave utterance. They were the only church to ever reach their generation for Christ. 120 men and women turned their world upside down without a microphone, a PA system, without a television, without a radio program, without a newspaper, without a Facebook Without Instagram, without, what's that thing called? Chit chat? What's it? No, no, Snapchat. Without a Snapchat, without a TikTok, without a YouTube. They won their nation. They won those people. Did you, can somebody give God glory? You can do. My gosh. Oh, thank God for media. I, I mean, honestly, thank God we have television and, and things we can do to reach people and to reach nations but I can tell you something folks this Holy Spirit can do it they heard a sound from heaven they were the only church to reach their generation for Christ 120 men and women turned the world upside down without anything without any help of technology Paul died believing he won his generation 
The tongue of fire cut through the darkness, broke the chains of dead religion and hypocrisy, set the captive free, opened up blinded eyes, made the lame to walk, caused the deaf to hear and the dumb to speak, lighted the path to Jesus Christ is still burning today in a remnant called the church of the living God. Can somebody give him praise today? Hallelujah. The church is alive. Hallelujah. I believe, oh God, in closing, let the wind blow. Let the wind blow. Somebody say, let the wind blow. Let the river flow. Let the fire fall. Let us be filled with the Spirit. We must, let us be God-possessed. So full of God, nothing else matters. Amen. How many believes we can make a difference? There is more to what we have. How many believes there's more? I believe that young prophet said in his mind, I just want to, can I say this? I want to believe in my, in my mind that he thought to himself, I don't know what that man has <laughs> to make iron swim, but I sure like to have what that man has. Musicians return. Heads bowed this morning.